Shall I say noise coming from your end there? Uh, how about now? Yeah, greatly reduced. It's, it's actually eliminated altogether. Okay. Yeah. I'll just, just remove it. Yeah, it's not gone. Okay. Well, yeah, a little bit of it, but yeah, it's totally compared to the, what we had before. So, uh, okay, I think we have people on already. We have Bill Muna here, Prosper. We have Olu Tosi. We have Abraham. Oriade is here. Uh, we have Aisha. Okay, uh, I think we have people on already. Okay, we have Kay Day. We have Ify, okay, uh, Blessing, Omolu Abiz here, uh, Pato Bazi, Agafa, uh, Oscar Matondo, that's Pastor, Ara, Emmanuel is here, Grace, Favor, Shidima, oh, Shidima has been a while. Pastor Tim, love it. Well, welcome everyone. Um, here we go. We have the engaging conversationist here today. That is a conversation with an 80s, we call it. Uh, uh, but uh, innocent is uh, agnostic, he said he is. So, uh, we, we know, I don't know what he plans for me today, so I will just hand over the uh, the driver's seat to him, and he knows what the schedule and the agenda is going to be like. And uh, so here we go, innocent, and uh, welcome. Take charge. Thank you so much, DC. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I I wanted us to instead of going directly to ask questions. There are a long list of questions. Many people left. They left comments, funny comments sometimes. I don't know if you permit me or like to read those few yes. before we continue. Yes, please, yes. Okay. <laughs> the first one that is here is they say, say innocent will become a very good pastor. via the Jesus teaching. <laughs> I read that one in the couldn't. Say, GSA, please, can you show us your library, if you don't mind? And somebody again, take it, Zeke, somehow. I don't, get, I don't get that. The name, the, the name is somebody, Zeke, Kiss? <laughs> okay, let me just keep going. Say, okay, innocent, Margaret, you say you are not innocent. If you permit me, I'm sorry to say, as from today, I call you knowledge. <laughs> 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 They like your knowledge, eh? So in response, somebody replied to the person that is asking you to show them your library that please don't ask of DSS library. If a man has written over 400 books, you can only imagine how many books he has read. I, so, don't, I don't know myself. I personally think that uh, one thing I like, I tell my people, my disciples, uh, um, people who, are, who want to know, about me is that I don't think that I know much. I think I don't know much. And I think I've not read much. Uh, I think I'm limited. I'm very much limited. And I know very, just uh, very, very little of what is there to know. And, uh, but the, good, the thing I would say is good about me is that despite my limitation, I try to make the best use of the little that I know. So, yes, for people who hear it, uh, I was actually witness because throughout the entire interview, you impress me all the time. Uh, it, it, it's, it's actually impressive to see that you know practically almost everything, almost practically. There's nothing that I mentioned will try to call that you don't know about. So then I say, okay, information, knowledge is 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 well is good to accumulate knowledge in your mind because that's what makes 
increase the value of human. It has to, to, to my understanding. Because the more knowledge you acquire, the more, because the reason why you're being generated today is because of the knowledge you have in mind. Without that knowledge, I don't know how people see, see you today. Because when we come listening to you, you see that hard of knowledge that is coming and some people even left similar comments. Somebody said, wow, this is so widely heard. It's mind boggling, that's what you say. We're all impressed. So somebody left a very heartwarming message. His name is Ernest Ebon. He insisted that the interview continue. So he sent me some message. Say thank you so much, Mr. Innocent, for taking the time to ask GSC this question. Some of them are being asked by Europeans. We could not answer. So I converted them to audio and listen over and over again and even teaching my children. So just keep doing it. They are great blessings. I will join you tomorrow. Blessings. So we went on to so do some questions. Every person needs to know. I called him. Okay, so he said, yes, I have to because I live in Germany and as a Christian, there are many challenge, challenging questions I receive from Germans. And through your broadcast, I'm getting a wealth of broader understanding of how to deal with them. So, so many encouraging messages like that that like people send and some critics too. <laughs> so, but, but it's good that people are learning from this. Yeah, so, I don't know, I don't know if you would like to comment which, to you, what aspect, before we go further into the questions, I'd like to understand what aspect of this interview, the three aspects that we treated that is more remarkable to you. Uh, I think what I will, what I most admire about the uh, three parts that we have done so far will probably be the first one and the reason is because the first one to me is more about God making sense of God and uh, for me that is my life and that is uh, the the thing I live for and the person I live for the my the essence of me so number part one for me is very very important very very significant i can talk about that forever now part two is more of what i think part two was about the culture right? about africa right yes okay part two uh, the culture africa tradition part two i would think is uh, something that I've, I've already settled uh, as far as i'm concerned because i already have my plans in place or now to bring changes and how to change the status quo in Africa in regards to that part two. And that's why I wrote this book, uh, How Africans Brought Civilization to Europe. So, and then I, but that is just, you know, that's just a research and introductory of to what is to come, but that is in the past. I have a plan of how to make the African culture and the African philosophy, medicine and pharmace pharmaceuticals and the poor poems and uh, poetry and uh, art how to make it glorious in the future and how to you know how to cut a niche or how to get a niche for the african church i mean for the african future and african culture in the future so for me that is already settled i don't even need to uh, i just want to do it i i don't because when i talk about things people might say oh you are talking about it you are not doing what show or something so i don't want to talk about i'm not interested in talking i will just do it so that what well, that one is about that and then the part the last part we did was about what economy the economic advantage ah the economic advantage of uh, faith and tourism i think it was tourism you call it religious tourism okay yeah religious tourism yes uh that for me um uh, is also you know less important than the topic of god because um the religious tourism and whatever is bringing people to africa right now for me this is not the best representation of god and of christianity so uh, I'm, I'm not proud of the christianity that is now being uh, practiced in nigeria and in africa so so i'm is uh, i'm not very impressed by what's going on with nigerian christianity uh, I'm one of their greatest critics, and I'm, I'm, I'm eager to demonstrate and show 
the real Christianity to my people when I get back to Nigeria. Okay. And of course, I, of course, I am impressed by the fact that uh, uh, you came up with this program and with this idea. Uh, but as concerning me, since I know, I have a whole book written actually for atheists. Yeah, it's a big book. Not this one, but it's a big book. It's, but it's a Russian language. So it's 300 page book that I wrote for atheists. And I just hope, I'm going to give it to somebody to translate. I think we, I don't know if we did that, but we are going to translate it. And I want to discuss on that because you have to see my own point of view. I got 10 questions to Steve, Stephen Hawkins, I call it. 10 questions to Stevie Hawkins. Or Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins and Stevie Hawkins, yeah. Two of them. He's one of the famous atheists. Yes, yes. I, don't... I, am still, I am now coming with my questions to them. 10 questions to them. So you are throwing me questions now, but I'm throwing questions to the, the great, to the great, to the most famous uh, atheists in the world. Yes. I don't know if he's taking them off. I've listened to most of them. They don't make very much sense to me because yeah. I... Like from the from the, the position I, I took personally, and uh, you know, day by day, my respect for you grows because I listened to the young man from think three years ago that had an interview with you. I've forgotten his name, but leave you he, from Holland. Exactly. So I listened to you know this thing. Many people underestimate it. It's what I call bigotry because. You must admit that Christianity is not entirely as bad as people think it. So, as most atheists like to describe it, of course, you don't agree with the concept in the Bible, but yes, can you admit that it's being used for positive purpose in that instant where maybe you came and gave good testimony, you can see that his life is entirely transformed. Yeah. My cloud, my loud enough yeah no, yeah it's very loud but i think it's a bit uh too loud maybe <laughs> too loud. oh no no it's okay just go ahead okay so Nibio came in with this testimony that he gave so i think people should take the that noise to... came back that noise that w that we left before came back so try to plug it in and see okay. if it will go now Okay, try to talk. Maybe it will be louder now. Okay, it's okay now? Yeah, it's better a little bit. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay. So, one of the questions that somebody left was, at the process, the last interview that we had, there were personal questions that were, were being asked if, what would you do if you discovered that Christianity was just a fallacy and it's all fabricated? You get a very strong answer to that. So then you gave one another example of the book you wrote about how African brought civilization to Europe. So the person said, the person was accusing you of religionism, that you were trying to invent, reinvent Christianity, that you're giving a total different narrative about Christianity that, that seems cool. But the person is not saying it's a bad thing actually, but the, the version you are proposing is the coolest version of Christianity. So, and then the person also talked about the book you wrote, you, you, because there was a question that I asked about if the development, if Dubai was developed by Christianity, and if can we have development without the aid of Christianity? You, you answer, you answer directly, and you said no, that most development can be credited to Christianity, and that our pre modern day civilization is entirely credited to Christianity. So, and then what I learned in the past videos, interview that you have had with people is to follow you patiently. That's what I've learned. So while you were saying that, I didn't, I didn't have any trouble in my mind. I was just following you because I know where you will land. I've seen you in so many instances. In the, for instance, the interview you had with Dr. Arams about the flying 
in Nigeria, I noticed from the beginning of the, of the interview, it was a little bit, it wasn't going. It seems as if you two didn't understand each other. He was going another direction, you were going another direction. He was saying something, he was expecting sympathy from you, but you were trying to make a point. So from the beginning of the whole thing, I was a little bit, okay, I said, let me just listen. And I saw that people were leaving negative, so many negative comments. And then at the end of the interview, you started explaining yourself, you started explaining your logic, and even Dr. Arams himself started reasoning with you. He was nodding his head because he saw that what he was saying was cool. So I said, okay, this time around, no struggle, you know, and just follow what he's, he's going to say. So you explain your standpoint, you explain, you try to explain why you think Christianity is important and why we need to create this civilization. To, to Europe, but what was missing in the uh, in the in the explanation you gave was the parallel, the, 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 the development with Christianity. You you argue on the moral standpoint. You explain that Christianity came and did away with slavery, and also did away with inequality, and it also took away the, that idea that women are less human, as inferior to men. So you 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 ad, you adopted the moral standpoint of Christianity, and some you also I also give an example of China, how the some their struggle, what led to their liberation, and what they did. So you argued that they were actually killing and sacrificing. If the husband died, they, they they take the wife along and sometimes bury them together. In most cases of some of their large emperors, they bury the entire family and even their horses and everything they buried them all together with. So you argued based on moral standpoint and you made your position clear. So I would like you to comment on this concretely. How what is the parallel now that we see? Apart from the moral standpoint of Christianity, what is the parallel of Christianity? Because we also look into the past and we saw that yes, there are great civilizations, a lot of them that we achieved through human callousness through bloodshed, through wars and so many atrocities committed by humans, but yet this development, we are, this are civilization, we are mighty. So now the point is, it doesn't matter how the development was achieved, but the development was there. It shows that the human of that epoch, we are motivated by something. They wanted to have a, a utopian society. They wanted a standard that they can be able to enjoy. They wanted beautiful edifices. They wanted roads that are tired. They wanted great castles. And they did everything they could to build them. So development independently without morality is what we see in the past civilization. So the point here is how can you explain concretely how can we develop? What is the parallel between Christianity and development? When I say development, infrastructure development, not on the moral standpoint. It doesn't matter whether slavery or sacrifice or demeaning women, no, but with development, countries with development. So, because I know many people who watched it might be asking these questions, they, like, just like this other person that I was sending, they try to say, okay, yes, DSC, I do that. Uh, how African brought civilization to Europe? And now he's saying it's Christianity that brought civilization. So which 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 is the position? Which so please if you comment on that. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, there were a lot of inventions that were done and were made in the old world uh, before Christianity. So we credit things like uh, alphabets maybe to China. Some people say it's to India. We credit uh, uh, writing to Egypt. Uh, we credit mathematics to Asia, you know, we credit, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a lot of, you know, yeah, archaeology, we credit, uh, you know, all kind of inventions and uh, all kind of discoveries, ancient in in discovery to different civilizations. Egypt, which used to be totally African, no, which is still African, but it used to be black African. And, uh, and also, you know, you will know of the pyramids, we know uh, of the great walls and the great uh, discoveries and inventions in Nubia, uh, that is the present day Sudan. And uh, we know of different um, great discoveries that were 
uh, you know, that are credited to black people. Black people, you know, as I've written in my book, were everywhere. But the difference between all those uh, civilizations and discoveries is that they were not they were not uh how do i say they were not popularized or is it popularized the word i'm looking for i'm looking for a word they were not like put into mass production they were they were not it they were these things were only limited things okay for example let's talk about uh, nigeria for example let's take the yoruba yoruba kingdom with the bronze and the uh, the artifacts they were doing, you know, those things were limited to families. They were not industrialized and they were not even commercialized. They were just some uh, families that were gifted in it, and these abilities were trans uh, were passed down family lineage. And so it was not a an industrialization or civilization thing. It was an invention, but it remained local where it is. Or let's talk about, for example, uh, the kingdom of Benin, Benin kingdom. One of the great cities, one of the great, I mean, it used to be a greater city and look more organized than uh, a lot of European cities. When Europeans came there, they were surprised that, ah, uh, uh, Cities in Benin, Benin city was well planned, like better planned than London, I mean, than any European city. So, but it was just one. It was not commercialized, it was not like industrialized, it was just like mono kind of thing. It was not, it's not a, if you, if you call it civilization, then it's just a local civilization. Like, um, Mm, like black people uh, invented, you know, water system, for example, and sewage. But it was still for just the elite in Spain. You know, they brought it to Spain and they did it. But it was just, just for families, for kings or for the deities. It was not a, it's not, not a mass popular kind of thing. The only, all these civilizations and all these discoveries that we have now that even the ones that came from ancient it was all ancient times it was only when they were taken a hold of by these last civilization christian civilization that they all became mass discoveries and mass revolutionized uh, momentum was given to them that you know is is uh, replicated and multiplied and uh, duplicated and is put into a machinery kind of is you know reproduction but even those civilizations like the Persian civilization for example also a lot of things they discovered there like uh what do you call that country near Mali in Africa uh near Mali where they have no they have Burukutu Burukutu was in Mali right what is not Central Africa, but it's a co country very near Morocco, between Morocco and Mali. What do you call that country? Niger. No, 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 no. Morocco. Between Morocco. You know, around that, all that area, there were a lot of discoveries that were there. Morocco, Egypt, Morocco, uh, Algeria. Timbu that, Timbuktu. Timbuktu. Timbuktu was in Mali. Yeah, but is that the name of the republic now? Bamako. No, no, Bamako is the capital of Mali. <laughs> No, it's, yeah, I'm, that's what I'm referring to, Tim, Timbuktu. But Timbuktu is the university, where the university was, right? The first university. But So all these things were there, but they were all localized. So, but when... Uh, there, no, no, there, there is, let me see. There is a country there. there is that, Timbuktu is just the university city, but there is this country. Uh, what do you call it there? Uh, just show me Africa, yeah. So anyway, it doesn't matter. So what what happened is that all these people, all these discoveries were there, but local, local. But when Christ, when Protestants began to teach that we are made in God's image, 
and that God is the creator. And because God is the creator, uh, that we are all supposed to be co-creators with God. In most religions all over the world, even Mauritania, I think the, the, the thing I'm looking for is probably Mauritania, right? Yeah. Is there a country like Mauritania? Yeah. Yeah, Mauritania is what I'm looking for. Mauritania, okay. But even though, uh, even though uh, Christianity came from the Jewish religion, even in Jewish religion itself, and any other religion in the whole world, it was almost like a crime to see your, to liken yourself to God. Humans, not no one single religion did this before, only Christianity. So it is the first time, and this is what gave birth to a, an explosion of creativity and, industri and industrialization and multiplication of stuff. And I will explain to you. What happened was that in all religions of the world, in, go to any culture, subjects or uh, indigenous citizens were always treated and always look at themselves as subjects to their God or properties of their God, of their gods. That means that their God could demand for their lives and they will sacrifice people, children or themselves or their other countrymen to their gods. This is what was happening all over the world. Now, but when Christianity came, Christ, Jesus began to say, I and my father are one. Ah, what do you mean? Even the Jewish people were saying it was blasphemy. But what Jesus was trying to introduce and which God, what Christianity introduced is that we, it's not just written, even though this has been written before in the, in the Jewish religion that we were made in the image of God. But even Jewish people couldn't pronounce the name of God. Talk less of thinking we were equal. We are in the image of God. Or we could be likened to God. It was like a big blasphemy. So, but when the Christian protestants began to teach this, that God is a creator, and we too can become co-creators with him. We are like him. Whatever you see God do, you can do. What? But that brought all these, all these protestants began to teach this all over Europe. That if you are made in the image of God, if you are a believer in God, you could be, you are a creator like God. And you are supposed to bring the kingdom of God to the earth. And you are supposed to duplicate heaven here. Just like he created the universe, he created the earth. We are supposed to be like him. We are like him. We are supposed to carry his image. We are supposed to create just like he's creating. And people began to put their creativity into place. And that led to led to uh, enlightenment, enlightenment and that you know the freedom led to uh, renaissance and uh, and the explosion i mean the philosophers began to be free because before the protestants the catholic church would not allow the uh, philosophers to think or anybody to even think outside of the religion you know the catholic religion but thanks to the reformation the freedom came for people to use their mind so we have the explosion of philosophers you know, uh, you know, enlightenment age, and people began to use, you know, but most of these people came from the church. Can you believe it, Innocent, that in 17th century, 18th century, after the Industrial Revolution, and 19th century, it used to be 75, 95% of all Industrial Revolution. 95% in those, of all the big innovation of they were all coming from Christian cultures of Christian nations. Now it has been reduced. Now it is still much. Now it is 75% of all the inventions we now have. They are connected. They are either coming from uh, countries in Europe or they are coming from countries in America or they are coming from countries uh, in, um, in, in where Christian nations are like Australia, other places, and uh, Jews, Jews, a lot of Jews, but those Jews were living mostly in Europe, in Europe. 
So all these people, all these 75% up to now. Now, some of them might be atheists now, you know, they, but they are coming, all of them are still coming from these Christian nations that was created through uh, Protestant teachings and they have the ability of man to become like God, to create like God. And that's what I was just trying, trying to say when I talk about that, the fact that our civilization today is credited to. For example, let's talk about roads. Uh, okay, we had roads before Christianity because of the Roman Empire. We had, uh, but road will be, for example, something like a luxury. It's just like one main road, you know, and, you know, luxury. But to build a whole city and make, I mean, what we are seeing now is all after Protestant uh, Reformation. And it's all after Industrial Revolution that is coming from the European continent. And, and uh, then when we talk about technological breakthrough and that everybody could actually improve their lifestyle, but because before the Protestant Revolution, only 1% of the world was living okay. But right now, is 40% of the world living, you know, at least. But civilization is in 60% of the world. So it's much more larger because of these, uh, you know, activities of the, the Christian nations and the missionaries. Now, they will say the missionaries did a lot of evil, but they also did a lot of good because they brought mass... Because education... Let's take education, for example. You know, education used... Before Christianity, education used to be looked at as something that is for a certain limited group of people. But the Christianity came and said, that no, God is light. And he said, we are the light of God. Everybody must get that light. So, and... Um, that even the printing press, you know, and was invented just to be able to print the good news, and then it, be, it became the the, purple, I mean, the 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 basis of industrial revolution itself. So, uh, so a lot of things that I'm talking about mass. You know, I'm not talking about individual things that were created or that the civilization brought before, but I'm talking like the mass that will make the large population of the old earth to benefit. The good, the general good that make not just the, uh, you, for example, in Europe before they used to have just the aristocrats or they used to have you know the elite, the fodders, or they used to have uh, you know just the bourgeoisie, you know people like that. But the Christian teaching, you know, spread this good that everybody has dignity, everybody has to be equal, and you know before God, not just the elite, not just the uh, monarchs and the you know the you know, very very few uh, privileged people. That's what I basically want. You know, was referring to. Okay, thank you so much. The I popularization, the the, the you know expansive, yeah, yeah, expansive and yeah, yeah. Okay. So since we are talking about civilization and invention, then here is another interesting question. <laughs> you won't believe that you have interesting people watching this. This is a very funny question. They say, say if Jesus or Muhammad was born in this epoch, they imagine them with Facebook account or large followers with a hashtag turning water into wine. You say, oh, Jesus or Muhammad using iPhone 7 and flying Lufthansa or Air Maroc instead of camels and donkeys that they do it to be born in this epoch. What do you think? What, what would they say using iPhone 7? What difference would it make? I think... Uh... Definitely, if Jesus were to be born in this epoch, he will definitely use the resources available at his, uh, at his disposal. And definitely, Jesus will use uh, anything that will help him to pass across his message. Jesus was very inventive when he was on the earth. For example, when Jesus would go to any city, before he would go, he would send some people ahead of him. That was a know-how that time. You know, he was going, he would, that is publicity. That is marketing. And um, in, in some other instances, whenever he comes to a place, he would, uh, even though he didn't want them to glorify him or to make him a king, but he was able to gather crowd quite easily. There were some, you know, some know-how behind that and some understanding behind that. I have a teaching about, you know, the strategies, the 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 thinking and this, the expansion strategy of Jesus. So all these strategies that he used, he used, very innovative. So I believe that Jesus 
will uh, be very innovative if you were to be alive today as well. Okay, so he will use Facebook, he will use Twitter, he will use iPhone 7, yes. and many, many more technology that are yep. available. I believe so. Okay. Okay. Now, for okay. Mohammed, for Mohammed, I'm glad that Mohammed is not alive today because, uh, because in his own case, uh, Mohammed also used technology and he was very creative, he was very talented, and he used technology of his day to spread his message. But he was spreading his message through force and through power. Right? Or, or as, as against Christ, that was spreading his message through tolerance, through love, and through just sheer good. But uh, Muhammad actually went to war against people that rejected him. And he, subjug he subjugated them, not just individuals, but he subjugated all nations, all cities. So I'm afraid that if Muhammad were to be alive today, he would get hold of the nuclear weapon. So that's why I'm happy that he's not alive. <laughs> Deckard. Okay, so can you comment on the, the, the issue of, of, of Europeans using Christianity as a political, as solely, solely as a political tool, that they use Christianity to take a campaign that there was less of a spiritual aspect of Christianity throughout the entire history of European uh, acceptance of Christianity, starting from Emperor Constantine downward to the Crusades and everything that was in, that Europeans mainly use Christianity solely as a political tool. And that it was entirely void of any spirituality, mostly in their cases. So the only people that embrace Christianity and try to see it from the spiritual perspective are the Africans or the Europeans we are we are mostly motivated by what they will gain and mostly and when Christianity didn't favor them, when they see that it was no longer of use to them, they abandoned it entirely currently in Europe so that we use it solely for political reasons. Can you comment on that? No, no, that's not correct. That's not correct okay. at all. Uh, if you are talking about the European elite, and if you are talking about what one thing you should understand, uh, innocent, is that even in those olden days, <laughs> despite the fact that Europe became Christian. You, but you should remember that that happened in the year 300. Now, by the time that Christianity got to the whole of Europe, it took another 700 years. So, by the time it got there, it was normal. It was mainly it only mainly came as a political as a political system. Because it was coming from Roman Empire. So the Roman Empire adopted Christianity, Constantine adopted Christianity as a political system and as a political faith. So because of that, a lot of Europe accepted Christianity more as a political, agreeing with what you are saying, more as a political system. Or religion rather than a personal encounter now in the meanwhile there were always people in the background that always had personal encounter with the Lord in spite of the political elite that use Christianity as a national religion so when I'm talking about Christianity and Christians uh, I don't like to refer to those Europeans as Christians. They were Christian nations, but they were not what we would call today as born-again Christians. But they were Christians like religious Christianity. So those Christians that, that we were talking about, I mean those Europeans that we are talking about that went to now colonize Africa, for example. Mm -hmm. Or that went to now uh, sell slaves. They were not born again Christians. They were coming from Euro Christian, Euro European Christian, Christianity, 
you know, Euro Christian, but or European Christian, but they were not having personal relationship with God. Let me tell you what happened with Africa. This, okay. this type of Europeans went and conquered nations, but they were simply looking for wealth. They were just <coughs> greedy and they were commercial, commercial people, merchants. They were greedy commercials, uh, entrepreneurs or businessmen or merchants that were looking for wealth. So all these people came and conquered the nations and then submitted them to their government. Now, when the real Christians, for example, let's say they conquered and divided Africa. But then when the born again Christians, the real Christians in their midst saw that their nations have subjugated other nations, then these same Christians now appealed and wrote letters to their emperors and to their kings and queens and said, allow us, your, heart, your majesty, to take the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and the light of the gospel to these nations under your jurisdiction. So the people who went ahead to conquer Africa and other nations were not Christians. They were Christians, but they were more merchants. Okay. It was like 100 years later or 200 years later. In some cases, for like in Nigeria, for example, the, Nigeria had been under the subjection of Britain for 200 years before the missionaries came. Even though these were Europeans, but there were no missionaries among them. Even before then, there were trade, there were merchants also who were trading in slaves. But missionaries came to Nigeria only 200 years ago. The first ones. But but uh, European uh, merchants have been in Nigeria since the 14th century. Mm. But they were just there exploiting, take trading. They were they went there like traders, but they were not but they were not they were not seeing themselves as the way we see. They were just like no more human beings that you see today. Like no more Europeans that you see today. They were not regenerated. They were not they were not parading themselves as Christians. But when the Christians now came, they called themselves not Europeans, but they called themselves missionaries. Now, then when the missionaries came, missionaries were not the people who conquered Europe, I mean, who conquered Africa. No, they came later. When they now came, because of the rights that their nations had there, they got permission, they were now the ones who, who were not trading. They were the ones who were adopting our languages. And they were the ones who were converting our languages into words, into written letters, into alphabets. They were the ones who are saying, no, these Africans must be educated. They were the ones who are not interested in our gold and our silver and in our wealth. But they were the ones who are giving their lives, dying out of malaria, and who are being eaten up by some of our people, uh, cannibal people, or whatever you call them. Yeah? Is it cannibal? You call them cannibal? Cannibal yeah. people. <laughs> yes. They were being eaten up and they were not dying. They were the ones who, when they die, they would say, don't take me back to England. Bury us here. David Livingston, for example, his heart, when they took him back to England, when he died in England, he, he said, no, get, my heart is in Africa. So somebody had to go and take his, they caught his dead body, stole his heart, and took his heart back to bury in Africa. Because these people were people who were ready to give their lives to Africa and for, to Africans. They were the ones who were building schools. They were the ones who were building hospitals. They were not the missions, not the people who conquered us, but the missionaries are the ones really who are the friends of Christ, they were the children of Christ, and because they were you no, know, you know, they were the real Christians, they presented a better picture of Christianity to Africa, like Mary Slezer, for example, like uh, <laughs> you know, you know, Ajayi Crowder, and all those kind of people. They were the ones who brought, you know, uh, progress, light, enlightenment, you know, to the African people. Not the Europeans, but the Christians. So I see a difference between Europeans and Christians in that sense. Okay, okay, good, all right. There is a, 
Interestingly enough, there is another aspect of Christianity, which I'm about to point out now. I don't know how that would be. The Jehovah Witness, they have a, a very special doctrine that they don't believe in hellfire. So they don't believe that hellfire exists. They, they are not a version of Christianity. And then we also have the instance of, let's say, Islam is at least 1,500 years old now, the Quran, when the Quran was written, the concept of Islam was being introduced to the world. Uh, so we have a religion that gave birth to Christianity, which is Judaism, the Christian, from Judaism. Then we have Christianity, which is old, 2,000 years old, and then we have Islam that came later, 500 years after. So, interestingly enough, this version of Christianity, Jehovah Witness, that they practice, they don't believe in hellfire, they don't believe it does exist. We also find this, that in the Old Testament, that hellfire wasn't mentioned. And also, in Judaism, there's no concept of hellfire, because there was this rabbi, in, in his name is Friedman, he was given lecture in Indaba, somewhere in South Africa. So, he was explaining why the concept of hellfire doesn't exist in Judaism. And if it does exist, that the only thing that they have is called the word is Gehinom that was translated. So this Gehinom actually means it's a purification process. And he said, according to him, that this concept of hell only lasts for the take 12 month. It's a purification process that if you're coming into a banquet, and you're wearing a white garment that is stained with mud and everything. You have to wash it and wear a proper garment. So the concept of hellfire doesn't exist in Judaism. Likewise, we don't find it in the Old Testament Christian Bible. And now, again, the Jehovah Witness, they don't, have, they don't subscribe to the concept of hellfire. So, and then we also look back into the history and saw when this concept of hellfire was introduced into Christianity, and it wasn't very long ago through the Roman Catholic Church. So the whole thing, there's this debate about it. So I don't know what should people think. How should we see this thing now? What is in your opinion? This hellfire, the debate surrounding it. Why is it that it's not found in Judaism and it's not found in the Old Testament? No. And the Jehovah Witness rejecting such concept. What can you say about it? Uh... <laughs> I know of that argument. Um, if you check, I'm trying to read open my Bible now. If you look into uh, Psalms 9, if you have the Bible, you can, or you can write it down. Psalm 9, verse 17. Okay. It says, The wicked shall be turned back into hell, even all the nations that forget God. Now, that's from the Old Testament I'm reading. Okay. Yeah, so, and then, you know, I could look and get many other references for you. I know about that argument very well. I know about that argument. Mm -hmm. This this argument is a big argument, again, in the circle of the Jew, Jews, Jewish religion. If you go on the internet now and just say, is, hell, is there hellfire in Judaism? Does Judaism believe in hellfire? You will see a lot of rabbi come because I've started I've st studied Judaism myself and I've listened to a lot of rabbi. A lot of rabbi know about this position of this famous rabbi. And that rabbi, you know what most rabbis have now decided? They are saying he should say it is his own opinion. But he should he ever say talk in the name of Judaism. Go and check out yourself. The, the most 80% of the Jewish rabbis today in the world, they all came to consensus, they had his speech, and they all said he is wrong, and they had many, many Tamil and all kind of uh, their references to disprove him that no, 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 that there is hell, concept of hellfire in the Old Testament, and that, uh, you know, the man shouldn't have spoken in the name uh, of, of Judaism, and that Judaism believes in hell, and I've just given you a scripture right there, for example. So, um, uh, so the thing is that you know, yes, that uh, Old Testament talks about hell. There is hell in the Old Testament. There is uh, the hell in Judaism. And Jesus, what is more important for us is that Jesus Himself spoke about hell. 
Jesus spoke about hell all the time. Because Jesus was speaking about hell when even in the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Jesus was speaking about hell when he said, I was hungry, you didn't feed me. I was naked, you didn't clothe me. And he said, put some on the right hand and the left and the left, side, the left hand side. The ones on the left hand side, take them and throw them in the, the place of darkness where there will be gnashing of teeth and everything. So, uh, hell it was not introduced by the Roman Empire at all. Hell was not you know, introduced by the Catholic Church. No. The concept of hell has always been there. It's even in Islam. Now, let's talk about Jehovah's Witness. Jehovah's Witness is not a... It is universally not recognized as a Christian, bona fide, bona fide, uh, Christian religion as such. Uh, it is more seen as a cult in Christianity. But even they, I understand where they're coming from. What they are saying is that the earth was created for the habitation of man. That even though sin has come and has disrupted the plan, that a time is coming, God has promised us to give us a new earth and a new heaven. When the time of the new heaven comes, even though we die now, before that time comes, we go to heaven, but when it's time, God will return us to the new earth. And we are not going to be living in heaven forever, or hell, but we will be living in, on the, in the new heaven that God is going to create. So that is uh, what they mean, that we are not going to be over there, but we are going to be here, that God is going to return both the ones who are who are righteous and the ones who are not righteous back to the earth. Okay. For eternal, uh, you know. Life. All right. So, so, so now we see that I uh, watch back most of the argument that most of the rabbi gave to counter this rabbi Friedman. They argue that the concept of hellfire does actually exist in Judaism, but it's totally different from the concept of hell in Christianity because. And Christianity said that you'll be sent to hell and you're born in the fire, furnace of fire, perpetually. But in Judaism, they say that you only say it for a period of time. It is a process of purification. Those are, they, are, they, those, they are two different concepts. Those are two different things. Okay. Uh, yes, in, in uh, Judaism, they have that concept that you are talking about as a, <laughs> as a temporary limited place uh, of uh, purification and... Uh, punishment but before you are delivered but it's for different they are it's a little bit more complicated but they also have another place where they are talking about hell just like in christianity as well because okay. jesus himself was a jew so he was talking from that concept of uh, you know in, if you look at the new testament there were different group of jews that you see in the new testament some of them were Sadducees, some of them were pharisees and some of them were the scribes you will see that one, one of the major things that differentiate them from one, or one another is that some of them don't believe that there will be resurrection to eternal life. And some of them do believe that there will be resurrection to life eternal and there will be resurrection to hell. So some of them, even there were, that is a major difference between the, the people of the old Jew, Jews. Some of them don't believe in hell. Some of them don't believe in eternal life. You know, either in hell or in heaven. Some of them did believe in it. Even during the time of Jesus, there were, you know, people like this. Okay. So we we find out that in the Bible, there's... there's I believe there's, that there's, 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 there's going to be hell. A lot of Christians also, I know a lot of Christians today who also don't believe in hell. Or a lot of Christian, um, a lot of... Um, what do you call humanistic Christians now? Are humanist. also, uh, humanists, yes. Humanist Christians are saying, uh, the good God, if God is so good, he, he shouldn't allow that. I mean, God cannot be love and create hell and send people to hell. That is not possible. But you know what? As far as I'm concerned, if Jesus, who was in heaven, said, so, said it is real. And uh, he came actually to tell us, to rescue us from hell. And when he died and he gave himself to death on, on the cross, 
he was actually saying, please, it was used, it was like blocking the road to hell. You know, like this, blocking the road to hell. Please don't go to hell with his own life and with his own body. And the Bible also records that after he died, he went to hell actually, and to fight against the spirit of hell that is holding up people there who didn't hear the gospel. And he actually preached the gospel in hell and, you know, for, to, to rescue those people or to give them a chance. So, you know, if Jesus and God will uh, emphasize hell so much, and there is so much emphasis in the New Testament on hell that it is, um, it is not advisable to ignore it. I will not try to ignore it at all. Okay. The, the, the interesting part is that why will God cre create hell first of all in the first place? Because he is omniscience. He knows the destiny of man before, even before creating him. So why will you create knowing fully well that yes, you will create a fallible human creatures and you know that they will fail, then after failing you create you set a place aside to punish them perpetually. Why will why will God do such a thing? For what to to, to achieve what? Okay. Uh first of all you have to realize that God didn't create hell for man. Okay. Hell was created not with man at heart. God was not thinking of man when he created heaven. A uh, hell, sorry. Okay. God created hell for the a devil and the fallen angels who were with him. So hell is a place that is created for Satan, not for the people. Now, because man has a choice either to listen to the leading and the lordship of Satan or to the lordship of God. So when man was deceived by Satan and man did listen to Satan, who to whomever you listen to, to that you are subject. Whatever you listen to is your Lord. So when one, one obeys the leading of pride, selfishness, egocentrism, or what we call satanic temptations and he decides intentionally with his own will to disregard the voice of God. So there is God that leads you, Jesus, that of us you say, okay, listen to my voice, you will follow me to heaven. And there is Satan that is saying, listen to my voice, you will follow me to hell. And you have the right to choose and you know there is an alternative which is Christ and you actually follow the one that says he's, he's taking you to hell, it is not a place that was created for man. It was created for Satan, and Satan wants to take with him as many people as possible to his own place. Why Jesus wants to take as many people as possible to his own place. Okay, so what language, what language was Satan, or Adam and Eve, what language were they speaking in the Garden of Eden? What language did Satan use to speak, to communicate with them? And what language was God using? The angel they were visiting in the Garden of Eden. What language were they speaking from the beginning? Oh, the same language that we are, they are speaking today. The Hebrew. same? No. The same, same language that Satan is using to speak today. Satan has a language today too. Okay. What is it? The language he used to speak to Adam and Eve and the same language he's still using to speak to us. And that's the same language he used to speak to Jesus. You know, Jesus, just Satan also came to Jesus in the in, in in you know on the mount, on the mountain when he went for fasting uh, in the wilderness. Sorry, in the wilderness when he went to fast and pray, and he spoke to him too, and he's still speaking to us the same way. So the same language he spoke in the Garden of Eden is the same language he used to speak to Jesus, and the same language he's using to speak to us today. So what is that language? That is the language of thoughts. So Satan, when we say Satan tempts people, when we say Satan uh, tempts people, we don't mean Satan speaks to come and tempt people. When we say Satan tempted Adam and Eve, we don't mean that Satan came to speak with language and talk like human beings because Satan is spirit, just like God is spirit. 
So the same language that God uses to speak is the same language God is Satan uses to speak. God uses the language of thought to speak to us. And Satan uses the same language of thought to speak to us. That is why it is human thought that will take them to hell. And it is also human thought that will take them to, to heaven. Somebody said, say how in God's name can the devil and his angels be hot by literal fire when they are spirit who do not have physical bodies, how can they be hot by fire? They say the God created hell with them in mind, so how can they be hot by fire? Oh yeah, because there is a, this is not a physical fire. You know, we, we can only determine reality by what we know, what exists to us, what our own reality, in our own reality we have fire, mm -hmm. right? And fire in our own reality is what we see, is what we have called fire. But, hello? Hello? Okay. Yeah, but, there, but in the spirit realm, fire also is real. But it's not only fire that is real in the spirit realm. Apart from fire, there are a lot of other things that are real. You know, when we die, we will also be real in heaven. In, uh, in, we will also be real when we die when we when we die. And it will also be body. We will have physical body. But not physical body, not tangible body, like we are saying now. But a superior body that doesn't die. A superior body. So for example, if you listen to the story of people who have died, they say, I'm seeing myself, I am still here, I'm standing here, and I'm seeing my body. But that body looks so like a dirty, inferior thing. Compared to the body that I have now. Yes. Okay. So. Is that an, a challenge with the internet? Will it be our own internet or its own internet? Huh? Because I'm okay. It seems I'm okay. Hello, are you there? Okay. Are you there? Yeah, I think yes. it's, it's good. Yes, I'm okay. Okay. Go ahead, sir. I can't... Pause in a little bit. <laughs> yes, I hear you now. Can I hear you? I, I, you are, it's like you are frozen. I can't hear you. I think there's a little bit challenge from the internet. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Is it clear now? Yeah, you can talk. Okay. So the person is like, so why can't God just forgive certain and if humanity peace. Okay, the, uh, the concept of forgiveness belongs to human. And the only reason why we have that concept of forgiveness is because somebody paid the price for it. So Jesus came not to die for Satan. Jesus came to die for humans. And why? Because humans are victims of Satan. But Satan was not a victim of anyone. So he's okay. responsible for his own action and for the consequence. Okay. okay, so why did God create Satan in the first place? Yeah, he had a purpose for him. And Satan had fulfilled that purpose for many years, for ages, before he saw in himself too many too much of significance and too much of importance that made him to, to resent in his faithful service. So he was created to worship, he was created to praise, he was created to serve God, and he did that for many years. So okay. Satan was not created to be evil. Satan was not created to be who we know him to be today. Everything God created was created good, including Satan. When it was created, it was created beautiful and nice. Okay, so does that mean that God never foreseen that the set, that Satan would turn into something monstrous as it is today? Well, uh, Satan, I mean, God could have foreseen it, but God is not a dictator. Even we humans that are not as wise as God, that are not as good as God, we don't like dictators. If we with all our, you know, frailties and fallibilities and 
weaknesses and limitedness if we, we cannot even tolerate dictators talk less of God okay. okay they say God created heaven and earth and he dealt, He created everything and ended and rested on the seventh day so but the, this seventh day is uh, named after Roman gods can you comment on that yeah. The people who are, the people who are saying that they are very limited, and that's why I am. Uh, that's why I said in my last meeting that don't listen to the African African Africanism of Africa Afrocentric philosophers of America, and don't listen to Nigerian pastors, and you know don't believe that that's the church we have in Nigeria. Those two things you have to be aware of them. Now, people who are talking that who are saying that. The you know seven days are his name named after uh Roman philosophy or whatever gods, God, gods. Roman gods they are very limited. There was no nothing like Roman Empire, nothing like Roman Empire when the story and the narration of creation ended. But there was no Roman Empire when there was Old Testament. Roman, the Old Testament didn't start, Christianity didn't start with 2,000 years ago, with Christ. Christianity started long before Christ. And the uh, narration of creation had been recorded ages before Christianity and before Roman Empire itself. The old Roman Empire only existed during the time of Christianity, a, thousand, a few years before then, but, you know, uh, 500 years before then. But still, it was only that time. There was no Christian no Roman Empire at all on the surface of the earth when this story was narrated. So it cannot be. It's just, just mm -hmm. so those are just some of the you know things people come up. The, the, the only connection people use is that uh, when Christianity was now adopted by the Roman Empire, you know, because of the citizens of Roman Empire at that time, uh, they made Christianity to confine with what they were already used to, to conform with what they were already used to. Not that they invented it. For example, the government is telling them, uh, okay, no more your pagan worship, no more the God of Sun, no more the God of something, no more anything like that. It's now Christianity. So they are looking into the Bible or into the Christianity and seeing what they could, how they could keep their old faith alive and then bring in anything that could be similar in this new faith of Christianity that they have brought to them to you know to hide under it as to hide their own old religion so that's the way that combination came it's not that it was invented okay. it's just like saying people going to nigeria now for example in my own country nigeria in my own uh, country nigeria and you know in my own tribe my own village we, all, we were, when i was growing up there there were no muslims only everybody was a christian but do you know that we still had our Yoruba idol in my room, although I was a choir member. So even though we were Christians, but we still had a way of going to see Babalawo and we still had our own God in the family. So it, it, it didn't mean that it was me or my family that invented that Christianity. So if somebody comes, they will say, oh, it's the same old, ah, but there used to be Shogo before now. Yeah, it is the same Shogo now. No, no, it's just that it came but my people, because it's now the ruling thing, it's now the reigning thing, they became Christian, but they don't want to get rid of their something. They just mashed it and put it under something. But we still say that. So it didn't mean that we invented it. It just means that we kept our own thing and used Christianity and put it as one and used one secretly and one as a face. Okay. The word unicorn, unicorn as a Greek mythological creature. Yes was found being mentioned this in nine times in the Bible. It has never existed. Okay. It's, it's, a, it's a Greek mythological creature, some kind of mythology, but uh -huh. it's been mentioned literally in the Bible in the book of Job 39.10 and Deuteronomy. Jude? And the book of Job. Job. Yeah. Okay. Job and, what? And Job 39, yes. chapter 39, verse 10, and it was also mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy. It's also mentioned the book of Psalm and the book of Numbers 23, 24, 28. That, that is exactly what I'm telling you. It cannot be that it is Roman 
uh, is this a Roman or Greek? In Greek mythological. Greek, Greek mythological something. That is exactly mm -hmm. what, this is the same argument. The, for example, the book of Job is the oldest book that has ever been written. This is before Greek, before Greece, before the ancient Greeks, before, before Roman. So this is just what people come up with. This is long before. This, this uh, uh, actually, Job was written before Egypt. And before the sojourn of Israel in Egypt. So this is a long, long something. So it's just, people bring similarity. And they now, because of what they are familiar with, they're now using this as an argument that that is what that, where that came from. But that is, you know, it doesn't have any archaeological proof to it. Okay, how, how can that be? Because the Egyptian civilization dated back almost 10,000 years. We have a 10,000 year civilization. And the, the, the Bible, it's, all, it's 6,000 years according to the calculation they did to the period of all this writing. So how, how could that yeah, be? Yeah, people, people talk about 6,000 years, but 6,000 years for me, that is just the history of the Jewish people. Uh, that is recorded, recorded history of the Jewish people. But before the Jewish people, uh, there was there were civilizations, right? But that is, is, doesn't mean that God of the Bible existed only is only existing only six thousand years. I know most Christians believe that, and that most Christians subscribe to the fact that the Earth is only existing for six thousand years. I don't. Okay. I believe that God has been there for millions of years. And the earth and the universe is much more older than 6,000 years. Now, a lot of Christians will say this is wrong. That, uh, you know, I don't even think that. Let me tell you something. I don't even think that the account of creation we are seeing there is the beginning of the old of all of creation. I think that account of creation that we are seeing in Genesis chapter 1 mm -hmm. is the account of the realm that we are in right now. I think that before this realm, which is the earth realm, uh, or planet, that there is real life where God lived, where the angels lived, and that was billions of years or trillions of years before he now decided to give the account of the creation of the earth that we are saying in Genesis. Yeah, cool. So somebody is asking, he's saying, so why do we conveniently refer to God as he and not she, or probably it? Because uh, men and women on the earth are only limited to certain phrases and to certain uh, expressions in lingu linguistic expression. So I think that uh, if there had been better uh, linguistic expression that is possible to man to use for beings that are uh, extra human then we could have come up with it. But because there is no uh, linguistic expression like that, I think the writers of the Bible just picked one. Because that time, it was the word of, it was the men's word. And men were doing everything. Women were just giving recognitions recently. Okay. So is it safe to refer to God as she also? I think is God is more than he or she. Yes, God is more than he or she. Okay, this this is coming from Science Daily Journal, a source from University of Kansas. They say a new research shows that some twelve thousand eight hundred years ago, an astonishing ten percent of the Earth land surface or about 10 million square kilometers was consumed by fire, wildfire. And so this thing is actually published by the papers, 28 authors include KU Emeritus Professor of Physics and Astronomy, 
Adrian Melot, a professor, and Professor Brian Thomas, 2005, the graduate from the KU University, so that the 12, 12, there's 12,800 years ago, they almost 10 million square kilometers of earth was consumed by by wildfire. So that that this is also close to the period of the ice age that the, the, the world so we we were in ice age all of a sudden an outbreak of, of liquid fire, of wildfire that burned almost this percent of, of, of earth. So is this also part of God's plan or what is it that going to listen? Um the way I understand that is a bit different. Okay. The Bible talks about ice age, what science would refer to as, as ice age. Mm -hmm. The Bible talks about the time of, uh, what was his name now? It just escaped me. I wrote about him in my book, in one of my articles. I wrote an article about it. Uh, when the earth was divided. So there is a, a record in the Bible when the earth was divided. Uh, maybe I could actually try to find it. And that time, well, you know, what happens is that, you know, what I think, according from what I read in the Bible, I could picture that the old earth used to be at a point, one piece, one large piece, one large uh, piece of the earth, just one piece of the earth. It used to be one single continent, one mainland. And uh, I think what happened is, so at the at a particular time when this thing happened, the, the there was a shift and a movement of the earth that led to the earth uh, dividing, dividing up. And when that happened, you know, because of the energy and the uh, li liquid and it, you know the the uh, what do you call it, the temperature of the earth under the earth. I think what happened was that that was the time when uh, the, the uh, Asia divided away from Africa, America divided away and all that. I think that was when the, that incident of fire was recorded. And uh, that is the way, that is the understanding that I will have about it. I'm trying to look at the place here in the, in the Bible. Uh, if I don't see it now, I will get it ready for, I didn't know. I'm going to ask a question like that. I'll get ready for next time, but I'm going to try to look for it. Nobody read this my article or what? Uh, well, it was it was a, a, quite a long time ago when I wrote it. So that's what I believe. I believe that uh, uh, this was recorded in the Bible, and and uh, and but it's not a popularly known story. People don't even talk about it, but. Uh, I think that will be what we are talking about. Yeah, go ahead and let, maybe you can ask another question if you if you are ready. Okay. Uh, the next question is: Since seventy seventy percent of Europeans have abandoned Christianity, are they all going to hell? In your opinion? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Uh, I think God sees the heart of men. Mm -hmm. And because God sees the heart of men, some of them might be having personal relationship with God in their own way that we don't know. So, you know, I don't think everyone will go to hell. I think only the ones that consciously reject the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior will be going to hell. But they did reject Jesus Christ. They do not subscribe to Christians. It's most, it's most especially the young generation, the European young generation, are growing constantly and do not subscribe to the Christian. They reject it outrightly. Uh, what I think about that is that what they have rejected is probably the Christian religion. Oh, God, I saw it. So let me give you the passage I was looking for. It's in Genesis chapter 10. Okay. Genesis chapter 10, uh, verse 25. It's give, it was giving us the history of the earth and the geology of creation. So in this place, we see that in Genesis chapter 10, verse 25, it talks about, And unto Eber, unto Eber, were born two sons. The name of the one was Peleg. Peleg, remember that name, Peleg. Peleg, yeah. P-E-L-E-G. 
So who is Peleg? For in his days was the earth divided. For in his days, the earth was divided. Which means that the earth used to be one lump of land, earth. So it is in that process that you will see fire, you know, everywhere. Okay. The, the, this, this is actually interesting because it, it leads right straight to the next question oh. that says Adam and Eve gave birth to Cain and Abel. And then they went and married. They, there was no account of other females around in the wilderness. So who did they marry? Ken and Abel. They, 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 the record was that they went on to marry that he, he knew his wife and then they had sons. They had children. But so who, 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 the, who are those people from the part of the world? And they also have Cain who was being caused by God to, to, to wander in the land of Nod. So that is, is, is actually the next question. So who are those people that we don't have the record of them in the Bible? Who are those women? Where are they from? Because Adam they didn't have any female children. <laughs> uh, that's not true. Okay. That account is not true. And that is what most people use against Christianity. But a lot of these people, they don't know the Bible thoroughly enough. And I'm going to, let us go into the Bible. Let's go into the Bible, into the book of Genesis. Genesis what? Verses 1 to 8. Okay. Verses 1 to 8. Okay. It says, this is the book of the gen generations of Adam. So he's telling all the story of Adam and the earth and the earth and how the, the, you know, the earth became populated through Adam, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him, male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created and Adam lived a hundred and thirty years so Adam lived one hundred, not thirty years not hundred years not seventy years hundred and thirty years okay, okay. created on he lived hundred and thirty years and begat a son okay. in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth so Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve gave birth to a son, and the name yeah. of this son, yeah, what? No, no, I actually thought Seth was the third, but it's third. Yes, was the third. Okay. This was okay. after. This is chapter five. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, I'm writing chapter five. This is after. I'm just trying to say that you spoke about, uh, El, no, uh, what was his name, Abel and Cain, and that yeah. Cain was sent away. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to say that after Cain, they gave birth to another son, which is Seth, right? Seth. Yeah. Okay. Now let's continue. That's not the end of the story. And the days of Adam, after he begat Seth, were 800 years. All right. And he began, he begat sons and daughters. Yes. So we as we don't think that Adam and Eve, we thought that Adam and Eve only gave birth to Abel and Cain, Cain and then Seth. But there is a place here where he says, and they be, and he begat. Songs that is verse 4. That is Genesis 5, verse 4. Okay. It begat sons and daughters. So, because they are living like 800 years, 500 years, 700 years, 1, you know, almost 1,000 years, 
It's 800 years, 500, 700. They are living for so long. Can you imagine? Because he has many sons and daughters. Mm -hmm. They had to, they couldn't regenerate from other people. They regenerated from their different brothers and sisters. That's how they populated the earth. So the, the story that people who don't know the Bible narrate is that he only had those three songs. But they don't see that little phrase, you know, because the Bible is not talking too much on, you know, like a history book, just phrases. Mm -hmm. But the fact that he begat or he gave birth to sons and daughters, most people mostly disregard that or don't notice that, leave that out. And because they don't pay attention to that, they seem to now be saying, okay, uh, you know, so how can three sons give birth to where they are their wives? No, he had daughters as well. Okay. <laughs> Well, I, I think maybe maybe the debate comes from the angle that before the issue of set came into the picture, the, the, it was mentioned earlier on before chapter 5 that they went on, like Cain was caused to wander in the land of Nod, and it was said that whosoever laid eyes on him will kill him or something like yes. that. We see the blood of... So, yeah. so. You know the reason why? Because they were having many other sons and daughters, and because they were going to be spreading... And they had chased him away. They would not know him. They would not recognize him away anymore because he had left. He has been chased away from the home. And anybody that sees him, either from the grandson or grandchildren, that could happen. So I don't see any problem in that. Okay, somebody is asking a very interesting question here. He sees, he, and this one is about Nigeria. You see, you see, Fela Anikola Kuti is loved and admired greatly by Nigerians and around the world. His friend to Kwame Nkrumah, who, who is an, uh, an Afrocentrist, and Inamdi Yazikiwe, who is a Pan Africanist, but himself, also that Fela is an animist who criticized Christianity and Eurocentrism. Do you think he is in hell? Or... Um, I don't I cannot judge categorically and say, is in hell. If he's going to be in hell, it will be God's decision. And if he's going to be in heaven, it will also be God's decision. I think uh, Afri uh, Fela was an African hero, a Nigerian um, great uh, monument, monumental, monument, monument, mon <laughs> whatever you call it. Monumental figure. Monumental figure. <laughs> monumental figure. Mm -hmm. So I think. Uh, that what nobody really knows what happened to him the last days of his life. Maybe he had a personal relationship with God that nobody knows. So it's going to be pre presumptuous of me to say he's either in heaven or hell. But I know one thing, there is hell to be rejected and there is heaven to gain. Okay. I think the entire contention is this person is trying to point out this, seeing how greatly Fela had influenced the entire country, even though he happens to be an animist, is what is the bone of contention here, because we see how active he was. He was fighting for humanity. So, and this other one said, so why, why, why does the God of the Bible have emotions? That he get angry, he regret, he's vengeful, full of vendetta. Why does he have emotions like humans? Um, when we describe or when we read God's description or the description of his actions or of his uh, emotions, we can only describe all that by what we know and by how limited we are. For example, if we look at the colors today, colors, you can only identify the colors that you know. But people who have, been, who have seen the vision of heaven will tell you that there are more varieties of colors that they are not even familiar with on the earth. And so what will you call them? You just call them the closest. 
Some, something that is closest to yellow, you just say yellow, but it's different, but yellow. Something that is close to green, you just say green, but it, even though there are no other color like that, but it used to be that there used to be just about seven main colors, like even a few years ago, or like, you know, but re now recently, more colors are coming out every day. So, but everything was just yellow, black, brown, red, black before. But now you have all kind of, you know, color descriptions that people talk about now. So when we read those descriptions of God in the Bible, that is the best that could communicate to us for us to understand what was happening or what God was doing. It's so those things are more languages or words for us to have a picture or to be able to identify in our own language, in our own human nature with what was going on with God. Okay. Thank you so much for the time accorded. I hope our audience we are blessed and with the knowledge you have answered, we have asked almost 20 something question already, which is really, really fast. So I hope you understand. We have a lot of the list of the questions. So you go ahead and drop your questions. I realize that many people see this program as very important because they have questions and they are not able to research personally on their own in the Bible to understand. And when they ask their pastors in the church, they are being encouraged to pray in closets. Maybe God will send them some revelation and most of them end up frustrated with the whole idea because they need to be taught. They need knowledge, literally. So knowledge don't fall from the sky and just come into your brain. If that's how it works, it will be much more easier. So many people find this really, really interesting and really, really enlightening. So thank you so much for the time I caught it. I will let you know. I see that we have exhausted an hour and 30 minutes. Though we started late. So... Thank the next so question much. is actually interesting. <laughs> Thank you so much. And we can Thank do it next, next, next Sunday. All right. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank and you, bye to everyone. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. bye. bye.